Hello, this is Dr. Betty Rubinowitz, NextGen's Chief Medical Officer and Principal with NextGen Advisors. Welcome to our podcast series. As we have just bid farewell to 2020, we'd like to devote our conversation today to our predictions for 2021. Uh, those predictions obviously pertaining to the healthcare system. As usual, I'm joined today by my colleagues, Graham Brown and Dr. Marty Lustig. Welcome, Graham, and welcome, Marty. Hey, Betty. Happy New Year. Thanks, Betty. It's great to be here. A recent Commonwealth Fund article very thoughtfully laid out that organization's healthcare predictions for 2021. I found the categories of predictions very pertinent, and I'd like us to use those as the framework for our conversation. So obviously, the first item and the first area that they uh, made some predictions on was the fate of the COVID-19 pandemic and the vaccination project that uh, we're in the midst of. So what I'd like to ask uh, both of you, and maybe Marty, uh, you could start, is what's going to happen with COVID? How long is it going to last? How do you see the vaccination challenge uh, unfolding and being solved? Now, I'd say that despite the slowness of the first month since they were uh, approved for emergency use, that I'm still pretty hopeful that in the coming months, this will become a, um, the logistics of this will get well worked out and that the capacity will continue to expand so that by hope, I'm hope, still hopeful that by sometime in the third quarter, things will begin to get back to whatever the new normal is going to be. Yeah. Do you think that the pandemic is going to uh, fade slowly, remain kind of a, a background uh, noise in the presence of vaccinations? Are we going to bid farewell to COVID and not hear about it again? Where, where do you think things will stand? Yeah, so the farewell issue is to me related to is it going to um, mutate enough so that it, it there's a form of it that's resistant to the vaccine, in which case this is, you know, nothing's going to be ended uh, when we get our vaccines. The, the alternative, I think, is that it's going to become more like the seasonal flu, where we will, it will still be around, but it will be at a level that's more manageable and will become sort of part of the endemic background of viral illness. To one of the things that came out in one of the predictions that we were reading about that I thought was interesting was the need for a rise in clinical capabilities that deal with people with long-term side effects of COVID. And that there are, there's probably going to be a chronic form of the illness that will become better understood and then the need for the resources to support those patients, since there are going to be so many of them. That's a that's an interesting uh, a prediction, Graham. How, how how do you kind of frame COVID in in your mind? I'm not so. I guess you know Marty's thoughts around the timeline and what was presented in this Commonwealth Fund perspective around third quarter or later. Um, probably applies to the United States. I'm not sure that it applies globally. And we are a global system now, wherein people continue, particularly if they feel like it's safe to do so, will ramp up their travel again and get back on planes and start going all over the world and potentially create a situation where as much as there has been vaccinations within certain pockets of population around the world, it's not comprehensive. And, you know, as we've seen the acquisition of vaccinations from these major pharmaceutical manufacturers by different governments, we know that there are huge gaps in terms of access to vaccines um, for COVID in Africa, in Southeast Asia and other parts of the world where if people are traveling to those locations, there may continue to be high levels of infection present. So I think those things need to be considered into what really is the long-term play for how it impacts healthcare in the United States. There are a lot of other factors that are going to mitigate us really getting our hands around it here. But nonetheless, given all of that, I think the thought around the ramping up of the vaccinations here in the United States is going to create a, a different and new level of protection 
Um, I think the estimates around 60 to 70 percent of the population needing to be inoculated before herd immunity takes effect um, is a pretty significant hurdle for us to overcome. And um, given the amount of vaccine hesitancy that exists in the population, which I think will drop over time as more people are getting vaccinated and the vaccines are proven to be safe, um, that still is going to be an element that's going to be kind of an unknown in, in affecting the timeline as to whether things really will, uh, will come toward normalcy. Yeah, I think another interesting angle on this is, is that as the, the public health risks diminish at some point, uh, even within the, just speaking of within the United States, um, what types of activities will go back quickly and on the other hand, which ones won't. So the whole issue of going back to the workplace for those who have been working virtually, of traveling instead of having virtual meetings, uh, I suspect those are going to move much more slowly than the public health environment would potentially allow for as businesses are trying to sort out what the new normal uh, should look like for them. You know, the other thing that I would just add that the Commonwealth Fund piece spoke to is a recognition that with the change of administration, there may indeed be a shoring up of the public health infrastructure um, and a real kind of concerted focus on what can be done effectively at a national level to bring greater awareness, greater capabilities, greater coordination to public health infrastructure. And so that's something that um, will be a bit of an unknown as we await the last few days of the current administration and the ability of the new administration with a balance in the Senate now to see whether they can affect some change in additional funding and additional resources for public health infrastructure. That will, that will go a long way potentially to um, making COVID more manageable in the short term. Well, and also preparing us for the next one. Uh, indeed. So I, I want to switch over from the pandemic, even though it remains very connected to all. It, it really is the kind of the backdrop, the, the background now to, to everything else that unfolds in 2021. I want to switch to two related topics. One of them is um, healthcare costs, your predictions of what's going to happen in 2021 in terms of healthcare costs. And then I'm sure your answer will bring in the, the next element, which is the, the plight of value-based care. We again have more, as you say, Graham, more clarity in terms of what administration is going to be impacting, uh, whose decisions are going to be impacting these topics. But if you could kind of speak to uh, those two areas and, and what your sense is we will see unfold in 2021. So I guess on the healthcare cost side, there's, there's two sides of this that come to mind. One is 2020 was a remarkable year in terms of utilization, where we saw very low utilization of certain types of um, preventive regular care and procedures and yet we saw tremendous utilization in emergency care urgent care um, ICU etc and so it really is a very strange year upon which to make financial predictions and one of the things that we haven't seen at least I've not seen a lot of reporting around is what is the financial status and situation from the uh, managed care payers perspective from the big health systems perspective. How are they doing financially? We certainly know that they got some uh, short term funds and stimulus dollars from the federal government to kind of tie them over at the health system level. Um, but nonetheless, uh, their financials are a little uncertain. How that then plays out into the into the following year to me is kind of an open question mark. Um, at the same time, there are, from a policy perspective, other issues at play. And so the Commonwealth Fund article does speak to the urgency to address the Medicare trust fund insolvency that they are anticipating is going to be insolvent by 2024. And that action is going to be need to be taken by the new administration around how they manage that cost target and whether changes to payment need to be made to reduce payments and therefore shore up the fund, 
or whether additional revenues or taxes can be put in place to shore up the fund. So I think those matters are going to are going to play out in this context of unknown financial accounting for 2020. Um, Marty may have a different perspective on on the payment side. I would just add to what you said. I think you know, one other element that I think is important to consider around overall costs this year are for uh, care for serious diseases that's been delayed because of the pandemic. The most striking example is probably colon cancer screening that hasn't occurred where it's likely there will be a f large number of folks who will present potentially with symptomatic disease that's going to have obviously both financial and health uh, costs for those involved. So in a certain way, mitigating the low costs we saw this year because of reduced utilization, coming back with a bit of a rebound that maybe all of that care plus because these patients are presenting with more complex presentations uh, because of the delay. Exactly. I, I would just add, it, looking at what's happening right now at the beginning of January, where we have the most uh, impact we've probably seen since the beginning of the pandemic in terms of overloading ICUs across the country and overloading certain components of the delivery system that have really brought many hospital systems somewhat to their knees in terms of being able to provide the full scope of services that they normally do. So all that said, in terms of the short-term impact in this first quarter, that's really going to determine in many ways how the rest of the year goes. Um, then the question, I think, also becomes the where are the payers at and what's going to happen at the contracting level in terms of value-based contracts. Again, I think because of the severity of what's going on right now, it's going to delay uh, some of the movement in that regard, even though I think there's increasingly built up um, momentum on both sides of the payer and the provider to move more aggressively down the value-based uh, chain. I think the providers who were already hesitant around taking downside risk, given the uh, uncertainty of the current situation are not going to be any more interested. They're still going to be really hesitant to take downside risk in the short run until things settle down and are clearer. An interesting aspect of the predominance of the fee-for-service model in the United States in the past year is I think it exposed the reality of the risk that exists with a fee-for-service payment structure. And when we saw the plummeting of revenues within certain ambulatory and health system operations in the first and second quarter of 2020, um, I think it did show indeed that there's a lot of risk in that model alone and that moving into a value-based type arrangement that has potentially up and downside risk on both sides um, isn't necessarily any more difficult. It's, it's a different group of skills and it's a different mindset for organizations, but it doesn't necessarily put them at any higher risk than they're at now. So interestingly, there's been a lot of writing around uh, forecasts that there will be increased adoption of value-based care to protect against the uh, ambiguity of the fee-for-service model. We'll see if that plays out or not. There, there seems to be more interest, more talk about it. But to your point, Marty, you know, time will tell and uh, it, we'll see if people really start renegotiating things this year in a new way or if they sit and wait it out a little bit longer uh, until there's real movement in one direction or another. Another uh, topic that uh, comes to mind, I can remember in a blog that I wrote in 2020 predicting that 2020 would be the year of the patient. I think we were aware that patient engagement was beginning to take the center stage and be a dominant uh, theme. I was interested to hear if you think that 2020 has been a, a pause, a gap. Have we continued uh, the quest for uh, deeper patient engagement and uh, patient inclusion and patient kind of dominating kind of the, uh, the attention of uh, practices in, in, in good ways? Or do you think 2021 uh, will be a setback? Where are we at with that uh, topic? 
I think the patient absolutely has become the center of the care model in a way that we hadn't seen that focus in the last decade. Um, the the uh, back to the financials, you know, the the fact that patients weren't coming into the ambulatory environment, weren't getting care, weren't going in to get procedures and get their knees done or get any kind of um, discretionary services undertaken in a way or preventative services really forced healthcare providers to reach out to patients to to say to their high risk ones you need to be paying attention to these certain conditions or these medications or these complications and for others there was a real effort to get patients engaged on different platforms through virtual care through outreach through omni channel quote unquote uh communications and so i think there's been a lot of effort to ensure that you know the healthcare business model doesn't work if patients don't come. And there's a real recognition that uh, they need to, that providers need to create a strong relationship with their patients, keep their tabs on them and where they are and what's going on for them from a healthcare delivery perspective and what their needs are, and make sure that those that are highest risk of having bad outcomes if their care isn't provided are indeed being monitored. So I think there was a big shift in 2020 already. And I would anticipate it continues into 2021. Yeah, I, I think the, the longer the pandemic goes on, the more the patient, this idea of focusing on the patient and understanding their needs from their perspective and meeting them where they are, when they need it, it that, that, that theme is going to continue to strengthen. Um, and, and my personal hope is, is that it gets strong enough so that when COVID is no longer the driver of that, that it still continues uh, as, as a theme moving forward. I'm encouraged by uh, that answer and um, we'll probably end on that note. I would like to emphasize to our listeners that we uh, did not give specific predictions vis-a-vis -vis virtual care because they're everywhere and from everything we're hearing, uh, virtual care will be strong and uh, continue in 2021. We think it's still a very important theme, but wanted to highlight these other themes uh, as well. So I'd like to thank uh, Graham and Marty. Uh, thank you to our listeners, of course, for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's discussion, consider subscribing. It's an easy click of a button. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Betty Rubinowitz with NextGen Healthcare. Have a great day.